Hi, my name is Brad Constantine, and this is a podcast of the New Testament. I'll be using as the text the King James Version, along with the Joseph Smith Translation. Although this is not an official recording of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, every effort's been made to be as doctrinally accurate as possible. I'll also be using quotes from general authorities of the Church, the Apostles and Prophets, and BYU professors and others, and uh, every word out of the Scriptures themselves. So if you're ready for a really detailed analysis of the New Testament, you've come to the right place. Welcome. Hey there, and welcome back. This will be for Galatians chapter 2. The heading reads, Paul goes to Jerusalem. He contends for the true gospel. Salvation comes through Christ. Verse 1, Then fourteen years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also, and I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of, of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. Although Paul was opposed to circumcision as essential for salvation, and he emphatically declared that it was not needful for Titus to be circumcised, soon after the Jerusalem council, Paul circumcised the young Timothy before taking him as a companion on the second mission. This action provides an insight into Paul's thinking. He saw a difference between necessity and convenience. With Titus, the question was whether or not circumcision was essential for salvation. Thus, Paul opposed it. With Timothy, it was a matter of rendering him acceptable to the non-Christian Jews where he would do missionary work. Paul was willing to allow circumcision as a concession, but not as a requirement, so that the Jews would be willing to listen to Timothy teach the gospel. This distinction reveals something of Paul's mind and method. That was by Robert Matthews. In circumcising Timothy, Paul apparently was humoring the Jews. As far as the gospel law was concerned, the act was wrong and should not have been performed. Circumcision was a thing of the past, but seemingly the social pressures were such that if the ordinances had not been performed in this case, it would have alienated the Jewish community and stopped them from investigating the gospel. Hence, Paul performed an unnecessary and in fact improper act to attract the Jews toward that religion, which would teach them in due course that the law of circumcision was fulfilled in Christ. That was all by Bruce McConkie. Timothy's mother was a Jewess and his father's Greek, and his father a Greek, making Timothy Jewish under Jewish law. Paul did not suggest that Jews should give up circumcision, only that Gentiles need not practice it. All right, verse 4. I think I read that before in another lesson, but uh, it was apropos at this time because of the discussion here. Verse 4. Notwithstanding, there were some brought in by false brethren unawares who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But of these who seemed to be somewhat whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me, God accepteth no man's person. For they who seemed to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision, or Gentiles, was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision, or the Jews, was unto Peter. In other words, Paul was teaching to the Gentiles, and Peter still was teaching to the Jews. Verse 8, For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me towards the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, in other words, Peter, James, and John, who seemed to be pillars or first presidency, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. So there's a division here where assignments were concerned, that Peter, James, and John were going mostly to the Jews, and then Paul and Barnabas were going to the Gentiles. Verse 10, Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. So there's an explanation that needs to be done here, what he's talking about. I think we've talked about this also before when we were talking about the book of Acts. Even apostles and prophets, being mortal and subject to like passions as other men, have prejudices which sometimes are reflected in ministerial assignments and decisions. But the marvel is not the isolated disagreements on details, but the near universal unity on basic principles. Not the occasional personality conflicts, but the common acceptance for the good of the work of the faults of others. It is not the conflict between Paul and Barnabas which concerns us, but the fact that they, being even as we are, rose thereafter to spiritual heights where they saw visions, received revelations, and made their callings and elections sure. The fact of their disagreement, thus bearing witness that we, in our weaknesses, can also press forward to that unity and perfection which shall assure us of salvation. That was by Bruce R. McConkie. 
But Peter, no doubt, had his side of the story. Fear, fear may not have been his motive, and Paul may have acted prematurely. Paul admits that the mission of the pillars was to the Jews. If intense Jewish converts reacted negatively to the Jerusalem Council decision, James and Peter may have sought a, a transition delay to convince the stubborn. If Peter labored to bring this about, Paul may have put pushed conformity to the council's ruling ahead of its time. Paul evidently retold the story because the Judaizers used the episode to give the impression that Peter agreed with them. The incident is instructive in showing two strong leaders agreeing on a principle that came by revelation but applying it with different timing. Paul does not say that Peter permanently separated himself from the Gentiles. These candid examples show how revelation came after deep searching. Paul reviewed them, of course, to show that church leaders stood with him in teaching salvation through the revealed gospel, not through the Mosaic law. That was by Anderson. Peter temporized for fear of offending Jewish semi-converts who still kept the law of Moses. Without question, if, he, if we had the full account, we would find Peter reversing himself and doing all in his power to get the Jewish saints to believe that the law of Moses was fulfilled in Christ and no longer applied to any other or anyone, either Jew or Gentile. That was again by Elder McConkie. There is harmony in the first presidency and quorum of the Twelve Apostles today. Gordon B. Hinckley said, Each man is different. We speak from various backgrounds and experiences. We discuss ways to improve and strengthen the work. At the outset of these discussions, there may be various points of view, but before the discussion is ended, there is total unanimity, else no action is taken. The Lord himself has declared that such unity is an absolute necessity. So as Elder Hinckley, President Hinckley said here, that uh, no decision of the first president See, in Quorum of the Twelve is made unless it's unanimous. Verse 12, For before that certain came from, J from James, he did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. For the other Jews dissembled, them, dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dis dissimulation, or their hypocrisy, concealing and disguising true doctrines with false ones, believing doctrines that simulate true ones that have a semblance of truth, but are in fact erroneous, and that's what dissimulation means. Verse 14, that was by Elder McConkie. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of the Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews are by nature... And, and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. The Greek meaning underlying the word justify is to make righteous, to declare righteous, or to acquit. The implication is that when individuals are justified, they are looked upon as righteous and as though they had committed no sin. In order for us to receive salvation, we must be able to stand before the Lord as just persons, as righteous individuals, not as sinners. That was out of the Studies in Scriptures book. When we truly exercise faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, repent, are baptized by immersion for the remission of sins, and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, then the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of promise, seals or ratifies these actions, and we are justified by having our guilt transferred to the Savior, who made an infinite atonement for us, and he now looks upon us again as just persons, or as having never committed sin. Having done the, forget, the foregoing under the influence of the Holy Ghost, we continue on in faithful observance of our covenants to sanctify our lives so that we will be prepared to enter into the celestial kingdom of God. Again, that was by studies in the scriptures. A modern scholar explained clearly the difference between justification and sanctification in Paul's discussions. In its theological sense, justification is a forensic or purely legal term. It describes what God declares about the believer, not what he does to change the believer. In fact, justification affects no actual change whatsoever in the sinner's nature or character. Justification is a divine judicial edict. It changes our status only, but it carries ramifications that guarantee other changes will follow. In biblical terms, justification is a divine verdict of not guilty, fully righteous. It is the reversal of God's attitude toward the sinner. Whereas he formally condemned, he now vindicates. Although the sinner once lived under God's wrath, as a believer, he or she is now under, the, under God's blessing. 
Justification is more than simple pardon. Pardon alone would still leave the sinner without merit before God. So when God justifies, he imputes divine righteousness to the sinner. Christ's own infinite merit thus becomes the ground on which the believer stands before God. So justification elevates the believer to a realm of full acceptance and divine privilege in Jesus Christ. Justification is distinct from sanctification because in justification, God does not make the sinner righteous. He declares that person righteous. Notice how justification and sanctification are distinct from one another. Justification imputes Christ's righteousness to the sinner's account. Sanctification imparts righteousness to the sinner personally and practically. Justification takes place outside sinners and changes their standing. Sanctification is internal and changes the believer's state. Justification is an event. Sanctification is a process. Those, who, those two must be distinguished but can never be separated. God does not justify whom he does not sanctify, and he does not sanctify whom he does not justify. Both are essential elements of salvation. That was by MacArthur. Verse 17, but if we, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. P Peter and Paul, both of whom were apostles, both of whom received revelations, saw angels and were approved of the Lord, and both of whom shall inherit the fullness of the Father's kingdom, these same righteous and mighty preachers disagreed on a basic matter of church policy. Peter was the president of the church. Paul, an apostle, and Peter's junior in the church hierarchy, was subject to the direction of of the chief apostle. But Paul was right and Peter was wrong. Paul stood firm, determined that they should walk uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. Peter temporized for fear of offending Jewish semi-converts who still kept the law of Moses. The issue was not whether the Gentiles should receive the gospel. Peter himself had received the revelation that God was no respecter of persons and that those of all images or of all lineages were now to be heirs of salvation along with the Jews. Further, the heads of the church in council assembled with the Holy Ghost, guiding their minds and directing their decisions, had determined that the Gentiles who received the gospel should not be subject to the law of Moses. The Jewish members of the church, however, had not been able to accept this decision without reservation. They themselves continued to conform to Mosaic performances, and they expected Gentile converts to do likewise. Peter sided with them. Paul publicly withstood the chief apostle and won the debate, as could not otherwise have been the case. Without question, if we had the full account, we would find Peter reversing himself and doing all in his power to get the Jewish saints to believe that the law of Moses was fulfilled in Christ and no longer applied to anyone, either Jew or Gentile. And I think I quoted that before. That was by Elder McConkie. Um, anyway, that's the end of the chapter, and we will see you next time. Bye.